something. Thank you everybody so much for coming today. Um, we want to extend our appreciation that you are here with us. We're so excited and thrilled for today's webinar. During our time today, we will provide an overview of the Council of State Governments and our partner Center for Policing Equity. We're also going to share information on upcoming opportunities for our learning communities in the fall. Then we have the team from Denver Star here to talk about all things data, how they use data to inform decision-making, who's on their team, and how they created their data collection plan. To begin, we're going to hear from Chantal Ramsey, a policy analyst with the Council of State Governments. Thank you so much, Emily. Welcome, welcome, everyone. We are so happy that you are here with us today. Um, Andrea, would you kindly advance the slide, please? Thank you. So just to give a huge uh, overview of the Council of State Governments Justice Center, we are a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that combines the power of a membership association serving state officials in all three branches of government with policy and research expertise to develop strategies that increase public safety and we strengthen communities. Next slide, please. We have three goals. Our goals are to break the cycle of incarceration, advance health opportunity and equity. And lastly, we use data to inform, we use data to improve safety and justice. Next slide, please. And how we work. We bring people together. We drive the criminal justice field forward with original research. We build momentum for policy change and we provide expert assistance. Now I'd like to turn it over to our partner, Michelle Feldman, who is the Director of Partnerships over at CPE. Michelle? Hello, good afternoon, good morning, great to see you all. So I am, as Chantel mentioned, Michelle Feldman, I'm the Director of Partnerships at the Center for Policing Equity. So what do we do? Um, we do science for justice. We say that we're justice nerds, so how our organization started was um, our founder, Philip Atiba Solomon. He is um, an academic. He uses data um, to measure racial disparities in policing. Um, and uh, Dr. Solomon teamed up with uh, Dr. Tracy Cassie, who is based in Denver, and um, she was a deputy police chief there. And they wanted to work together to measure their department's racial disparities and traffic stop and use of force and that kind of thing. So that that was really how it all started. Um, and now we team up with um, folks, uh, law enforcement agencies, communities, and uh, stakeholders across the country to use the science to shine a light on what's going on and then have policy solutions that we can implement to make changes. So next slide. So like I said, we're trying to make policing less racist, less deadly, um, and trying to really get alternatives to policing because we don't need somebody with a badge and a gun to respond to every issue. And that's why, um, you know, so many of you here have done this work in depth. Next slide. And you can see we've worked in over 30 states. Um, we've worked with over 60 law enforcement agencies and We've helped, uh, we've been um, inside with communities that are include over 85 million people in the United States, and we continue to grow and to partner with different organizations. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> One last thing. This is our impact um, on policy changes. So as we partner with law enforcement agencies, we try to make systemic change um, the agencies that have worked with us have adopted one or more of these policies. So duty to intervene, ban on no knock warrants, ban on neck or uh, restraints and ban on tear gas. And our next kind of iteration, we're really working on um, traffic safety and ending some low level enforcement. Thank you so much, Michelle. Next slide. Um... Thank you so much, Michelle. So CSG has partnered with CPE and we are proud to present Unlocking Democracy. We have a suite of these fabulous, fabulous offerings for all communities that are exploring alternatives to policing. 
Um, I'll go over briefly our learning communities, our data connection, and our elected leaders council. Next slide, please. Communities are already exploring ways to redesign public safety. However, much of the dialogue, policy, and practice around these are fairly new. We have virtual learning communities focused on some of the most pressing public safety, public, <coughs> excuse me, pressing public safety issues faced by communities and consist of different modules to support participants in implementing emergent evidence-led interventions and documenting the process and outcomes in their efforts. In the fall, we will be launching learning communities geared towards college campus community response, community violence, intervention, crisis systems, and youth diversion. Next slide, please. We'll also have an accompanying data connection initiative, and it supports each learning community with the tools needed to measure success and effectively use data to tell, to tell a story. Next slide, please. Lastly, we have our Elected Leaders Council. This is a peer-to-peer -peer learning community for, electoral, for elected officials, excuse me, and their staff members nationwide who are dedicated to spearheading innovative efforts to take actionable steps towards true public safety reform. We have a QR code here on this slide, and if you scan it, it will lead you to the landing page for our ELC. I'm going to turn it back over to Emily now, who will introduce our panelists for today. Thank you, Chantel. Um, today we're going to hear from members of the Denver Star team who are going to talk about how they incorporate data into Denver's mobile crisis response program. And joining us today, we have Shukri Muwakil, who's the Star Operations Manager at Denver 911, Brian Blick, who's the Quality Improvement Manager at the Denver 911 Communication Center, and Blake Christensen, a data analyst with Denver Public Safety. We're so excited to have them here with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to them. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, good morning, good evening, not sure where everyone is. Um, my name is Shukri Muwakil, Star Operations Manager. So. STAR is a support team assisted response. Um, it provides more or less, a, it's designed to provide a, a, a person-centric um, mobile crisis response to community members who are experiencing problems. Um, mental health, depression, poverty, hope, uh, homelessness, uh, substance use issues. So um, based on those, those different criteria, we have what we call different nature codes and I'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, STAR um, pairs a licensed behavioral health specialist or a clinician um, with uh, EMT at Denver, Denver Health. So our clinicians are uh, provided by WellPower and our EMTs are provided by Denver Health and they respond in pairs to these calls. Uh, STAR was designed to provide, to be a, a fourth um, option. So you have fire, police, EMS, and now you have STAR as was in, re in response to um, just different uh, calls throughout the community. Next slide, please. Um, implemented in, in 2020, uh, it was modeled after the Cahoots po program in Eugene, Oregon. And Brian will speak a little bit more about this a little bit later as far as just that history. Uh, designed more for non-law enforcement response. So STAR teams go out without uh, law enforcement. They go out without police. They go without out fire. They're not co-responders. They go out independently for uh, the focus of, so is there a weapon? Is there Are there injuries? Uh, what's the time frame? And is, is suspect still at the location? So safety is, is a threat. So the lower level, acuity calls. Um, 911 will, will, will screen the calls uh, for riskiness, uh, assist, um, intoxicated person, suicidal series, welfare check, trespass, unwanted person, and uh, syringe disposal. Next slide, please. And so these are the nature codes. So we have uh, assist, incident, exposure, narcotics, syringe disposal, welfare check, disturbance, 
intoxicated persons, um, suicidal series, and trespass. They're all lower live, lower risk calls, no weapon involved. Um, the, su the suspect is not at the, uh, um, at the premise and um, the, the safety is, is, is a lower level, meaning there is no need for police intervention. Do you want to give, Brian, do you want to give a little history about uh, the STARS inception? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so when we first started putting together our own STAR program, we did use the CAHOOTS program from Eugene, Oregon as a baseline. As we were going through that and looking at their policies, it sort of dawned on us that one thing 911 is good at and Denver 911 too, is we are very good at policy and procedure. We have everything written down. So why do we need to reinvent the wheel? So we already have a robust triage process that we're processing all calls. Our call takers or operators are universal. So they're taking police, fire and EMS calls. So because we already had those processes in place, we just used what we had to triage all our calls as normal. And then at the end, add star in there as a fourth responder, I, a response just like police, fire and EMS. When we first began and looked to start identifying the nature codes, the problems, um, that STAR would respond on, we got together as a leadership team. The very base of it was us sitting around on a white, uh, in front of a whiteboard and using our, I don't know, 100 plus years of collective experience to identify calls that we knew that were, had a high probability of having a mental health component to it and a low probability of having some safety concerns. Um, now, on this list, the only basically disturbance and disturbance family, as well as narcotics, those were not part of the initial pilot phase. Those were added post pilot. Um, specifically narcotics, we're addressing people who are in public using narcotics, not the sale, distribution, or manufacture of. And then disturbance, disturbance family. Disturbance family is very specific. So it's two non-intimate family members, maybe two brothers, two sisters, brother and sister, in a non-violent heated argument. As we moved on from the pilot phase and started getting into calls where there was the potential for some violence somewhere down the line, especially when you have a disturbance or a family disturbance, the possibility of those escalating, we really had to sit back and think, okay, in a situation like that, who's the best responder to send in order to reach the ideal outcome? And the more we thought about it, we realized sending STAR to incidents like that was the best case scenario. Next slide, please. So when we, our first introduction to data with STAR, uh, I'm just going to go over briefly. There are two things we were tracking in the very beginning uh, as we were trying to make our case for, you know, STAR working and later on for STAR expansion. So what you're seeing right now is a breakdown of the calls that our STAR units have actually run. So this is through, I believe, the end of June of this year. So over 11,500 calls that STAR has actually run. This started in June of 2020 and through uh, the end of June of 2023. Currently, I looked at our last data through mid-August and we're well over 12,000 calls already. I think around 12,200. Um, from the very beginning, the STAR incidents by problem type, uh, welfare check has continuously been at the top of the list um, throughout the pilot program and into now. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one thing we did that was very important early on is even though our pilot phase of STAR was uh, limited to a specific geographic area and specific hours during the day, we made sure to triage every call and determine if it was star eligible, regardless of where it was taking place or regardless of what time it was. So months and months down the line, because we had been identifying all these calls 
as eligible calls, even though Star did not run the call, we were able to make the case that yes, more units are needed. This is successful. We can keep going and going. Uh, so it was really valuable to start that off from the very beginning. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll go over this frequent uh, very briefly. Uh, this is the primary concern frequency for STAR. So this isn't 911 related. This is what the units on the street, the STAR units, are actually seen once they get on scene. So you can see that the top two primary concerns are going to be mental health and then that combination mental health and substance abuse or substance use. Uh, next slide. And with that, I will turn it off to Blake and he can go in much more detail about the data program with STAR. Yeah, as, as Brian mentioned, we we definitely put a lot of thought into how we were going to use data, um, not only to support the program, not only to, to track the progress of the program, but also um, looking towards expansion, looking towards measuring those outcomes um, from the very beginning of the project. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the early things that we did was to um, identify uh, those metrics within Denver 911, within public safety that we could measure, um, as well as what other data that we needed um, to support the program. And so very early on, we, we engaged in identifying these partners, these community-based organizations to engage data sharing agreements because those agreements, as anybody that has been uh, worked in government and tried to create these, these data sharing agreements, that they, they can be very uh, time-consuming um, to get all the signatures uh, necessary to, to share data, especially to share uh, PII information across public, uh, personally identifiable information um, across various organi organizations. Um, you know, after the pilot was, uh, it was after we demonstrated success of the program through the pilot, um, we also had the challenge of how to expand the project. Um, you know, it was very clear that, you know, very early on in, in the pilot that this was a successful way of triaging and handling um, 911 calls for service. Um, the question then moved towards how do we expand this program? How do we make sure that more calls can um be handled uh, by non-police that that traditionally were were dispatched to police, um, and so that was uh, definitely a thing that we engaged our community partners, um, as well as the community of Denver itself to um, to figure out how to to appropriately expand, um, not just to to um, put all these services in the downtown core of Denver where we see a lot of the uh, calls for service that were star flagged occurring, but also make sure that uh, some of the outer line neighborhoods. Uh, the more residential-based areas of Denver could also um, be eligible for a star response. Um, you know, as as we've on, been ongoing um, with this program, we've also uh, started to think through what other types of crises occur that result in police calls for service. Um, so it's not just behavioral health um, concerns that are resulting in police being dispatched to things. We know that there um, are other types of of issues in Denver's community that that land in uh, police's inbox that, that don't necessarily need a police officer. Um, you know, in Denver, we get around about 225,000 community initiated calls for service every year. Uh, we know a very small fraction, you know, like somewhere between uh, 10 and 20% of those actually result in an official police action. Uh, so that leaves, you know, 80 to 90% of these calls for service could have, could be handled by some other entity. You know, one of the things that we're, we're currently looking on is, is some, uh, Something we've identified as like uh, something we've um, bucketed as interpersonal conflict. Uh, so thinking uh, neighborhood conflict, neighbor neighbor issues, noise complaints. Um, are there uh, are there specific um, groups that could handle these types of calls for service as well? As we think through um, expanding uh, alternative response in Denver, um, and then obviously um, expanding the continuum of behavioral health responses making sure that um, the STAR contact is not just a one-time um, fix to the crisis, you know, take it from crisis level to just below crisis level, but also to make sure we have the proper wraparound services for individuals. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> you know, so kind of thinking through all those challenges, uh, we identified a number of personnel that, that are useful um, when trying to measure all these things. It's not just analysts. Um, but, you know, as Brian had mentioned, um, operations support calls, uh, supervisors, call takers, and dispatchers um, are all very important in how we can 
leverage our our existing systems to to be able to measure the impact um, and do the process evaluation uh, to make sure that we're um, delivering these services as intended. <clears throat> um, you know, specifically, we wanted personnel that understood um, how to integrate um, quick and easy augment uh, augmentations to our existing data collections and tracking applications. Um, one of the the early ways that we were able to flag calls for service for eligibility and be able to then track them afterwards as data analysts was just to, to um, create a string of text that um, call takers and dispatchers could could hit a quick key um, as they were going about their their normal course of duty and then be able to search our, our vast comment fields to, to be able to pull these um, and very quickly kind of identify here's how many times uh, star has been flagged. Here's how many times star responded to those calls. Here's how star is being associated to calls for service in other other ways. Um, and so being able to leverage these existing data sources was was a uh, um, huge and be able to measure the the process of associating star to traditional police calls for service. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we looked at both process evaluation and measuring outcomes. Um, so in process evaluation, we wanted to be able to measure uh, total number of eligible calls, total responses. Um, we also uh, did some time on task measurements um, using median time on scene, all those kind of using various uh, CAD fields. Um, and now uh, we're we're moving into identifying more of those outcome metrics. Um, you know, one of the early things that the community identified was um, how do we connect people in behavioral health crisis to community-based resources? One of the ways that we're doing that right now is through transports, uh, showing that when STAR arrives on scene, that they, they there's a different um, type of response based on where we're connecting those people to um, than when we see a traditional police response. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the ultimate outcome is to uh, reduce the future criminal justice contacts for these individuals in behavioral health crisis, um, you know, so th to do that, we're we're leveraging these data sharing agreements, um, and then connecting these data back to our um, safety data data systems, um, street contact, street contacts, arrest, jail bookings, um, being kind of the the data systems that we're connecting to. Next slide, please. Um, you know. To, to be able to measure all those things, we obviously needed uh, a very robust data collection plan. Um, and we worked to identify these key outcomes with community um, members as well as systems partners. Um, and we made sure that we could measure these relevant outputs as well as um, you know make sure that these outputs were um, commensurate with the outcomes that our community-based partners um, and our system partners uh, were uh, aiming to achieve. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously we needed to collect data that uh, indicate progress towards these outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one, oh, sorry, go back one, please. Um, you know, one of the things that we identified early in the STAR process was that um, public safety did not have the tools to address the um, crises that were occurring um, for these individuals in behavioral health crisis. Um, and so it, it was very clear that we needed to, to leverage these community-based organizations uh, to achieve these ultimate outcomes. Um, and so to do this, we needed to make sure we had uh, appropriate data security um, and quality assurance across not just public safety, but also our community-based partners um, to be able to measure these, share these data, um, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. And then the last thing we did was um, to have a research partner to, to uh, help us measure kind of these ultimate outcomes. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, these external uh, research partners provide is um, to to further elevate kind of the uh, methodological rigor uh, for measuring these ultimate outcomes. Um, 
as well as to provide these uh, to to provide us with the external validity of an outside partner. It's not just Denver Public Safety, Denver 911 saying that these are the um, results of this program. That that somebody else is is doing that work to um, identify the outcomes that we uh, are trying to achieve. Thank you so much, Shakri, Brian, and Blake for that wonderful presentation about data, the importance of data, how you created your team, the barriers and the challenges that you face. So now, at this time, we'd like to hear from our listening audience. I'm sure that you all have some wonderful questions. Um, please feel free, <laughs> excuse me, to drop them within the Q&A. Um, I do see two questions posted here in the chat and I will just go ahead and read them out. So Kelly had asked, why are people referred to as suspects? Sure, I can answer that one. Um, so that focus that you're referring to, that's pretty much the foundation, the baseline of every call. So it's basically just the information we're gathering uh, to ship off to the dispatcher. At Denver 911, we're separated by discipline. So the person that's taking the actual phone call is not the one on the radio dispatching. So basically our call taker is getting a very brief, a small amount of information to ship off to the dispatcher to make them aware of what's going on with the call uh, while the call taker continues to do that. So suspect location, um, it's sort of confusing. It's really determining if there is a suspect. So if, you know, in us triaging the call and determining what, you know, the primary complaint of the call is, if it is a criminal offense, if there is a suspect, we're trying to determine, you know, where that suspect is in relation to the caller for caller safety. Mm -hmm. That's also uh, geared on how we're evaluating the appropriateness for a star response um based on the severity of the acuity of the the response thank you so much we do have another question in the chat and this is coming from ryan is denver star tracking demographic data and is that self-reported or perceived by staff We would have demographic data um, if a police report was taken. So not in not very many of our star interactions is there um, a police report or, or a street check made because obviously police are not a part of those responses. Um, otherwise, it is the the, the behavioral health partner um, that is recording information about those interactions. Um, so those interactions. Uh, um, I don't believe have um, beyond date of birth demographic information associated to them. Okay. We have another question in the chat from Kayla. And Kayla wants to know, how has the community responded to STAR? Um, so Brian can help with uh, some more his historical. Uh, currently, um, my job is more geared at liaisoning with the different community entities. So like Servicios de la Raza, um, Well Power, Denver Health, there's all these different entities that are um, providing the services, providing the, the clinicians, providing the EMTs, but also the case management services for uh, the community, the response, the, the responses. Um, so, my job is to more build that uh, that collaboration and liaison. And so far, uh, there are growing pains with with any when any program of this magnitude, right? Any program that is uh, designed to to support as an alternative to policing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, we are we are working well together. Is what I what I can say. We are we are definitely growing. Um, and being able to identify the issues and work together to resolve those issues. Yes, it definitely takes a village. 
We do have another question in the chat. This is coming from Jessica. And Jessica wants to know, are there only behavioral specialists in STAR or do you have other responders on the team? So behavioral specialists are clinicians. So licensed clinical social worker, LPC, um, that's just the word we're using as opposed to a clinician. Um, and then the EMTs are the two that, that uh, the two, the, the team that go out. Did that answer your question? Thumbs up. Jessica. If you are able to, if you want to come off of mute, that'll be fine. She also typed into the chat. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Emily, do you want to take the next question from Melody? Sure. Melody asks, how did your team verify that the call types you chose for alt response were most likely to involve mental health? And after the responders coded their observations from calls as mental health, substance abuse, et cetera, did you reconsider those call types? So two-part question. In the beginning, uh, no, because we were still in the pilot phase. So we were pretty much committed to using those nature codes, but those nature codes were originally determined, not just by leadership sitting down, but us sitting down, plus the knowledge we had gathered from years of a robust quality assurance program, from years of developing curriculum and training, from years of working with community partners, uh, mental health care advocates. That's how we were able to identify those because it existed really within the policy itself. There was already guidelines for how, for, um, how to triage calls where um, the caller might have uh, a history of mental health concerns. So that that's really how we did it. Now that we're coming out of the pilot phase, and we really only came out of the pilot phase earlier this year, that is when we are reevaluating and expanding. Uh, and it's just sort of coming in waves as we're able to uh, get more actual resources out on the street, as we're able to take more calls, that is how we are growing. Amazing, thank you. We do have some more questions and let me just go to the next one. So this is coming from Melissa. So Melissa wants to know, regarding your community partner agreements, how do you overcome concerns about confidentiality, especially when it comes to medical, behavioral health, and behavioral health data typically protected by HIPAA laws? So I know uh, Denver, not Denver Health, but Well Power, they document to their own EHR. Um, and... Uh, so I'm just reading this question. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. So in regards to protecting HIPAA, that is the way we do it in regards to um, all the different entities. They have their own uh, process protocol in regards to uh, assessing data, documentation, things of that nature. Um, I don't see Mental Health Center of Denver, or, or sorry, Well Power. I don't see their their documentation, and I think that is how HIPAA is um, adhered to. Brian or Blake, do you guys have any more on this? Yeah, we have a, we have a pretty strong data sharing agreement with us and uh, and Well Power um, that. Um, stipulates kind of how data will be used and will be shared. Um, so that's kind of the foundation um, of that work. Um, and then, you know, sorry, one sec. And then all of our, our analysts um, are, trained, are trained in both uh, CGIS criminal justice information systems as well as HIPAA um practices and standards um and so it's it's the combination of the training and the the data sharing agreement that really uh, provides that trust across the two organizations <clears throat> and then uh denver public safety and well power have a long history of working together 
Uh, Brian, you might remember when the co-responder program started in Denver. I think it was 2017, 2018. Um, and so there's just there's just been a a, a, a long history of of Denver police, especially and uh, our clinical services group uh, working together uh, to respond to 911 incidents. Also have a question um, in our Q and A um, that says, "Is the feedback Shukri is receiving from community being captured and shared as other programs also going through implementation can be made aware of specific challenges that weren't forecasted prior to launching?" So, I guess, how is uh, feedback being incorporated into the uh, implementation? So, we meet with uh, the community members monthly in person. Um, and they give us objectives based on their expertise, what they're seeing in the community. Um, and we it, that's a part of the collaboration. Um, I meet weekly with the POCs um, as well of each of these different entities. Um, and we, we actually meet tomorrow. We have a, a list of community-based needs, um, strategic planning based on what is the community seeing as still an issue, still needing to be developed, things of that nature. And, and we uh, we work that out, we roll it past the bigger community, uh, the, 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 the bigger organization, and then we, we um, implement it as, as, as change, as, as long, so. Mm -hmm. So community has a, a, a strong input. Um, I'm the operations manager. Uh, but like I said before, my job is to collaborate and bring all these different entities, the voices, opinions, expertise into the into the forum so we can continue to build. Great, thank you. I'm gonna jump to this question in the chat here from Rana. She wants to know, Rana wants to know, is STAR supported by a specific funding stream, grants or anything else? Yeah, primarily there was a Denver ballot initiative. Um, I don't know what year, 2019, 2018, somewhere around there, um, that created a Caring for Denver Foundation. Um, and the Caring for Denver Foundation, um, they were initially the ones that provided us the grant money to create the STAR program. We have another question in the Q&A that asks, are EMTs more costly than police? And are there um, people experiencing crisis who have IDD such as autism spectrum disorders? And um, do individuals have to consent to services? Okay, what's the first? I'm trying to find that question. Um, it's in the. It's actually in our Q and A. So it it says our EMT. The first question is: Are EMTs more costly than police? To be honest, I'm not sure about that. Denver Health, that's their expertise. They fund their uh, the EMTs. And I'm not sure what their funding stream is in regards to what they're paid. And then the second part was, are there many people experiencing crisis who have IDD such as autism spectrum disorder? A variety of uh, diagnoses, IDD, yes, there is, we do have, just in my, my ride alongs in my experience, I've, uh, I've seen individuals on the spectrum um, I've seen uh, a, a wide array of like depression, um, hallucinations, all of these different types of uh, clinical uh, diagnoses. And it's, it's, it's our job to, as the, the clinicians, to assess and um, uh, identify the appropriate treatment plan. So where are we gonna send this person? Are we gonna send them to well power? Are we gonna send them to CERP ECOs or, uh, um, Rocky Mountain Human Services would deal with more of the like the, the IDD population here. So, just identifying and being able to case manage case manage their services appropriately is what we would do. And I can jump in based on industry averages. Uh, EMTs and paramedics cost less than police. 
there was and then piece, I'm sorry, um, there was one final piece to that question. Do individuals have to consent to services? Brian, do you know if they consent or is that they, will they, when they call in for 911, uh, they ask for what they want. That's, that is their, that is their consent. So they ask star, I need a star response based on X, Y, Z. And that's when the, uh, the call taker will will evaluate based on the severity of the, the, the safety level. So they do consent initially when they call in. Yeah, I think any transport that the STAR program would make would be completely voluntary by the individual. Um, you know, the, the personnel in the STAR van are not able to, to take somebody against their, their will against to, um, any of the community-based providers. Um, so that those will all be um, kind of just based on the discretion of the person as well as the the personnel that are in the SAR van. The only involuntary would be like an M1 hold and that would, we would need other aspects and avenues for that, so. I have a question in the chat from Kristen. How are you reporting on the longitudinal outcomes of the individuals that are treated by STAR clinicians? We are we are working with um, Urban Institute as our research partner on that, um, and so we get the um, contact information from Wellpower about all the people that they work with. Um, we're working on matching those against um, our jail management system, our records management system from police to get um, uh, offense reports, street checks, arrest information. Um, we're going to de-identify all of those to to give them to hand that up to the Urban Institute uh, to identify um, at, from the point of contact. Do we see fewer criminal justice contacts? Um, so that that'll be kind of the process to to get those data from Well Power through public safety and then over to um, our research partner. The second part of Christian's question is, how is the data from the call and on scene assessment shared with the CBOs? And how is the how is the client level or aggregate data shared back with STAR? I can take the kind of how we're getting it back from Wellpower afterwards, we have, um, you know, a, a, the data sharing agreement gives us all the information that the, the STAR um, personnel are collecting. Uh, so we get information about uh, what their first impressions are, what the state of change of that individual is in, um, and, and some of the uh, more intricate um, detailed uh impressions that the the clinicians on the star van uh, are seeing so that we can then uh potentially see what that has any impact on uh future criminal justice um impacts um you know let brian Ishkri uh talk about um how the star personnel are then giving that information to community-based providers i report the data uh during our monthly uh meetings to the community organizations. Um, so Wellpower has their data, Denver Health has their data, and then we have the data that we collect. And we all report that there's line of, lines of questioning and it's uh, interpreted there. Thank you, I'll go on to the Next question, are you able to share the amount of the original funding and what plans do you have to maintain this programming? You know, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I do know, so the funding was released in two ways. Um, part of it was earmarked for the operational aspect of STAR, the actual units. And then a second part of it was for creating a community-based network of providers that would work in tandem with the operations of STAR. Uh, 
sort of a network of providers that Stark could transport to or offer additional resources. I believe that part was $2 million um, as part of caring for Denver. So I apologize, I can't remember the exact amount for the operational side. Um, but one thing, based upon the success of STAR, um, we have uh, a lot of advocates within the city, within city council, uh, the mayor, who are very much willing to support STAR financially as it goes on. I'm glad you mentioned that question about, um, I'm glad you mentioned um, the work with community partners, Brian. We do have a question here in the Q&A that asks, how many CVO partners would you estimate are helping deliver response services? And is there an RFP process to find these partners? I, I think it's hard at this time. So, and Shakri, you can jump in here too. So the way STAR is split up, not only with funding, uh, but you have the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment, um, which is the overall administrator of STAR. So they play a large part in, uh, they're playing a large part in developing that, uh, that network of providers. Um, I know, uh, Shakri had mentioned uh, working with Cervezios de la Raza. Uh, they are the ones contracted with the city to set up that provider, um, that, uh, sorry, provider network. Um, and what was the second part of the is question? There an, yep. Is there an RFP process to find these partners? So I, I'm not sure exactly, and Shakri might be able to shed some light on this, on how Servicios is identifying the, um, the providers to put into that network. I know that originally in order to, um, you know, contract with the city to be the main point that puts together that network, there was an RFP that was released. So as far, regards to just their internal process of how they refer, um, so mental health, well, sorry, Wellpower and Servicios hold the case management, the provider, the, the, the treatment portion, right? And uh, based on the, the need of this now patient, the severity, um, the community relations, the community uh, connections, right? They'll go to Servicios or they'll go to Wellpower and then they handle their internal process in regards to uh, just like treatment assessment, things of that nature. Just scanning the chat to see if we have any more questions um, coming through. We do have one from Emil. Have you identified any gaps in the data collection process? And what are some key lessons learned regarding data collection from start until now? Yeah, I mean, on, on the gaps in the data collection side, I think that especially the community, the, the people that aren't kind of in this world assume that we just have um, omniscience and, and understand kind of all of the things that happen with an individual um you know we have we have a very limited scope of what we can see and what we're allowed to see especially within safety um and so i think you know, you know we, we'd like to know how much you know kind of you know the the research term is dosage um how much treatment a person is getting kind of what what do wraparound services look like um unfortunately we, we tend to only see um kind of that initial contact information uh what their initial impressions of the, of the clinician are um and then kind of you know, that's even an add-on of what we typically see. Typically, you just kind of see kind of when they're within kind of the 911 police uh, public safety world. Um, and so be, being able to see people get connected to, to downstream services, I think is 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 kind of where um, it is the limitation that, that we're, we're 
we're we're currently um, faced with, um, you know. But even within the public safety world, as I mentioned, like we we do have some kind of interesting and novel ways that we can leverage our existing data systems, um, you know, especially using transports to identify is star response, um, you know, substantially different than traditional responses is one of the, is one of the early ways that we're measuring connection to community based resources. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that if that kind of gets to the answer to that question, um, you know, but at minimally we're able to tell when a person um, interacts with the star van um, and then hoping to work with our, our research partner to identify whether or not that reduces the likelihood of future criminal justice contacts. Okay, we have one final question and then we're gonna wrap up the Q&A and close out. So this question is directly for Brian and it's coming from Thomas. So as a QI manager, do you use tools like root cause analysis to improve call responses? And how do you know the program is working at its best? So as QI for Denver 911, specifically what I'm focusing on is our operators identifying star eligible calls and then our dispatchers utilizing resources correctly. So we have a rather robust quality insurance program and as a subset of our overall QA program, we also do special audits just on STAR uh, and determining if people are tagging uh, eligible calls correctly and if dispatchers are using resources correctly. We've actually just started to employ um, an AI program to assist us with that to um, to pick out potential star eligible calls. And then I have a team of auditors that will go through and do a quick check, not a complete audit, but a quick check to make sure that eligible calls are indeed being flagged. All right, thank you so much. We are now going to get ready to wrap up Q&A and we are going to now talk about next steps. If you could advance to the next slide, please, Andrea. Thank you. So we wanted just to let you know, as we close out, we recognize that the work isn't always easy, and we definitely want to uplift, uplift and support communities that are seeking change. We wanted to share some important dates for our upcoming Unlocking Democracy year 2023 to 2024. We will also drop all links to web, upcoming webinars, applications. We will drop that in the chat as well. So launching in the fall, we have four learning, communi four learning communities dedicated to college campus, youth diversion, and crisis systems, and community violence intervention. As mentioned before, we will have our data connections throughout these four learning communities, and they will all be taking place launching in November running for a total of 10 months on alternate months, and we will end in July, 2024. If you could advance the next slide, please. Here are the important dates for you all to know. We have our upcoming learning community applications dropping on September 6th, right after Labor Day. Right now we have our elected leaders council's applications open, please, please, please. Join, join, join. We have upcoming webinars. Tomorrow, we have establishing, establishing community response models for college campuses tomorrow at 2 p.m. And the registration link is there. We also have coming up September 7th at 1 p.m. Alternative first responder models and how they can support youth in crises. All of these have been dropped in the chat for you. We want you to take this opportunity to join our learning communities. We offer great peer-to-peer -peer learning experiences. We offer wonderful subject matter experts, as you have heard today from the Denver Star team. And we also offer targeted technical assistance. And the best thing about this, this is free, guys. You don't want to miss out on this free opportunity. We thank you all today for joining our webinar and we hope to see those applications rolling in soon. Thank you all and take care.